This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 690, and this week we welcome Dr. Connie Arabs and Dr. Kishore Konkari. We're going to be talking about a recent presentation they did at the ASHRAE Winter Conference called Advances in Reactive Air Cleaning Technologies. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. And don't forget, after the show, check out afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc., TSI. Dot com Tramex at tramexmeters.com Healthy Indoors Magazine healthyindoors.com And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that no one correctly identified Giles Clayton as the first person credited with the first use of the term Sergeant Major, and that occurred actually in 1591. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, February 17, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Name the holder of a device, of, I'm sorry, name a holder for a patent on a device, and I quote, to provide a simple, cheap, and effective apparatus for the production of ozone or such gases as are obtained by the action of high-tension electrical discharges, unquote. Back to you, Joe. Okay, Cliff, thanks. Dr. Connie Arabs has an extensive background in chemistry, semiconductor technology, and ad advanced engineering for manufacturing. She has a bachelor's in chemistry from Rutgers and a PhD in organic chemistry from Princeton University. She is currently the president of Prometheus Strategies, which provides chemistry consulting services to companies in the field of advanced air cleaning and surface cleaning technologies. She's also a consultant to the Puri Company and co chair of Puri's Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Kishore Konkari is the president and founder of Ansight LLC. He's a specialist in computational fluid dynamics, a noted expert in the field. His PhD is in CFD from the University of Minnesota, and he has regularly published in several technical journals. Dr. Konkari is an ASHRAE fellow and distinguished lecturer. He's also currently serving on the ASHRAE Board of Directors. Welcome both Dr. Arabs and Dr. Konkari. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Great to have you here. Let's, let's start with a little background on um, what is this, and please forgive me if I get my terminology wrong, I'm not a chemist here, uh, but photohydrolytic UV-generated hydroxyl oxidation. Dr. Oh. Arabs, can you give us a little background? Sure, and let's abbreviate that as PHO to make it simple. Okay. PHO technology basically uses UV energy to cleave a water molecule to create a hydroxyl, which is an HO. It loses a hydrogen atom. Hydroxyls are powerful natural oxidants formed by the air and surfaces by decomposing VOC and killing microorganisms. Hydroxyl devices sustain this dynamic indoors. They abstract hydrogen atoms from ambient VOC to form organic peroxy radicals, which we often see as ROO radicals. They are also powerful oxidants in their own right and stable enough to circulate throughout a treatment space via a series of chain reactions with successive VOC. 
typical hydroxyl radical and ROO radical chain reaction times are 12 minutes until two ROO radicals recombine and are deactivated. Hmm. Now, how is PHO different from other reactive air cleaning technologies? We hear about like bipolar ionization and some of these other technologies. Can you kind of give our listeners a little fundamentals on the different types of reactive air cleaning technologies? PHO devices are designed to generate a single natural oxidizing agent, the hydroxyl radical. And because it's a quantitative technology that has had its uh, methodology published in a peer-reviewed journal, we know that it can maintain natural concentrations of hydroxyl radicals and hence the downstream oxidants, the ROO radicals and the other chemicals they form. Hydroxyl targets are about one to three million hydroxyls per cubic centimeter. In nature, that range can be anywhere from one to 10 million. So because hydroxyls and their organic oxidant radicals have such high oxidation potentials and fast reaction rates, they are effective outdoors and indoors in decomposing VOC and killing microorganisms by a radical chain reaction, which is unique to this kind of radical chemistry. The oxidation byproducts they generate, which include aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, and organic acids, among others, are rapidly decomposed and they do not tend to accumulate. This is basically the same process that occurs outdoors in nature. Other reactive air cleaning technologies differ, generate different kinds of sanitizing agents. So for example, photocatalytic ox oxidation, which is considered one of the major competing technologies, use high surface area matrices coated with titanium dioxide semiconductor catalysts which adsorb the contaminants and decompose them by activating the catalyst with UV radiation. That generates oxidants and these oxidants are consumed basically at or near the surface with the bonded uh, microorganisms and VOC on the catalysts. These basically act as a filter, a very effective filter, and the materials that are decomposed are those that are bonded onto the catalyst surface. And when you talked about um, the byproducts and the oxidation byproducts rapidly decomposed and do not accumulate, how do they decompose? What, what causes that decomposition? With radical chemistry, hydroxyl radical chemistry, its only function is to take a hydrogen atom from every VOC it comes in contact with. And it does this with the highest oxidation potential of any chemical except elemental fluorine. This starts a series of chain reactions. So the organic peroxy radical it generates finds another VOC, steals a hydrogen atom, it finds another VOC. And this chain reaction process is what sustains the effect of that first hydroxyl for an effective lifetime of 12 minutes until two radicals recombine. So the chemistry is basically free radical hydrogen abstraction chain reactions. Okay. Um, I'm still a little confused on the byproducts, but I guess we will come back uh, to that a little bit. The, Go ahead. The, by, the byproducts would be basically just different VOCs. So if okay. you oxidize a hydrocarbon, for example, you can create an alcohol with a single oxygen somewhere. When that gets recycled in the device or it finds another ROO oxidant, another hydrogen atom is abstracted, generally near the oxygenation site. That's cleaved. It forms other smaller VOCs. And gradually, this process mixes up all these additional compounds, which are also oxidized. So it can't tell one VOC from another. So the byproducts are very similar chemically to the reactive agents as the original VOC, and it just keeps going. The byproducts so, generally uh, produce CO2 in water if this is sustained long enough. I guess that's the key. It, it has to keep going back through those reactions for those to eventually be decomposed completely? Yes, because that's what the sun does. The sun is sort of a UV generating device in the sky. So we're bathed in these hydroxyls and all their byproducts outdoors naturally. And this, this dynamic works as long as the sun is shining. In order to create this effect indoors, 
the hydroxyl device uses these high performance mercury arc lamp optics, which generate selective wavelengths of light similar to what is occurring outdoors. So that's like a little tiny sun working indoors to keep this dynamic going. And as long as the devices are running, as long as the sun is shining, the sanitization chain reactions continue. Okay, we have, let's talk about the pros and cons of various reactive air cleaning technologies. Um, I, I'm getting there's two major categories, two other major categories, photocatalytic oxidation and ionization. Can you talk a little bit about when they're useful and when maybe they're not? Uh, PCO devices are unique in that the wavelength they use to generate and reactivate their catalyst generates absolutely no ozone. So they were designed for small spaces. The first application was the space shuttle. And they're very good in that regard because you can be assured that there's no ozone generated. They adsorb like a filter, the constituents in the air. And if the surface area is large enough, they can do a very good job at decomposing what they capture. The limitations for that are of course, the same things that make them useful. It's the surface area of the catalyst. Uh, so they don't scale very well to large spaces. The catalyst being a reactive surface gradually is deactivated by adsorbed carbonized VOC. And it's also poisoned by water vapor. So over time, it becomes less and less effective. Uh, it also tends to release and not reabsorb small molecules. So as it cuts up those that are adsorbed, the small molecules like formaldehyde, acid aldehyde, Etc. don't rebind to the catalyst and they do tend to accumulate. And this, this is based on published data. And also as the catalyst embrittles and becomes aged, uh, it forms particulates of uh, carbonized VOC and titanium dioxide, often in the very small range of 2.5 microns. So uh, it is essential if you're going to use this, that you change that material, that matrix often, just as you would any filter. And I, I want to bring Dr. Konkari in here. Um, first of all, Keyshore, it's great to have you back, number one. And um, I, I was going to introduce you as Keyshar Konkari CFD instead of PhD, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if people would get the joke or not. Um, you're, you're our CFD expert here. We love having you back. I just wondered if there's anything you wanted to add to what uh, Dr. Arabs already has told us today. Yeah. Uh Joe, first of all, thank you for having me uh, again on this show. It, it's really fascinating to be here. And you and your team and Cliff, what you are doing is amazing job. 698th uh, episode. It's a long uh, thing <laughs> you are doing and great service to all HVAC community and ventilation and indoor air quality. So first of all, thank you for doing what you uh, what you're doing here thank you we appreciate that yeah so um this is heavy chemistry what we are uh, hearing now but basically what these reactive uh, processes are doing are, are kind of releasing some agents sanitizing agents through the air into indoor spaces correct so what we are used to for ventilation is dilution, where you filter the air out, bring the outside air in, and bring that clean air into indoor spaces. And we tend to dilute the concentration of pathogens or contaminants, correct? So let me give an example. If you take a couple of spoons of sugar syrup in your glass, and add water to that, what you are doing is basically diluting the sweetness of that very heavy, sweet syrup. Now, what reactive technologies are doing and attempting to do is, well, they are not just diluting it. They are removing, actively removing the pathogens or contaminants from the space. So coming back to my analogy, instead of adding a glass of water to that syrup, in order to reduce the sweetness, you are taking a couple of scoops out from that sugar syrup and then add the water. So it, we are not taking the dilution totally out 
from the equation. We are still sending the clean air, but that clean air loaded with the reactive agents, correct? So it's a double-edged sword. It's diluting and also reducing the count of pathogens into the space. But the key here is, in both cases, whether you are using dilution or you are using reactive air technology, both are using the air as a medium. And, and so how air distributes into the space is, is very, very important. And in particular in case of reactive air cleaning technologies, the life of those agents which are introduced through the supply air is critical factor. I mean, you may introduce millions of those into the air and somehow you get caught into this stagnant zone, recirculation zone in the space. Well, they will be gone before they reach to the pathogens. Correct? So that's true with dilution because airflow patterns is key in successful ventilation, correct? In good ventilation. You may bring all the air you want. But if it doesn't reach the breathing zone of occupants, then it's of no use. Similarly, you can bring any reactive air cleaning technology. And if we can't uh, distribute those reactive agents to the sources of contaminants or the breathing zone of occupants, they will not be effective. So uh, airflow patterns play an important role, whether you are using dilution or reactive technology. All right. Well, thank you. It's always good to get a different perspective. And I know you're big with ASHRAE and um, you helped to bring this presentation that, that you and uh, Dr. Arabs did to the ASHRAE group. How was it received? I mean, this is a somewhat controversial topic. Let's let's face it. Um, how was it received? Yeah, I mean, um, just to add one more name to the whole thing, it's Charlie Weddell from uh, 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 from a needle point uh, ionization, uh, GPS uh, was also one of our speakers. And I put this together uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one is there's a lot of ignorance about reactive air technologies. I mean, what are those? What they do? How do they work? All these things need to be told to people. At the same time, we are in, in pandemic uh, time and even today, we are bombarded with so much marketing. <laughs> and everyone claims their product is the best in the world. And that's what marketing does. That's what their job is. For a consumer of these technologies, we need to separate the facts out from the fiction. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to bring all these people on the same podium and have kind of a civil dialogue about this, uh, spread the word, educate the people. And Dr. Raps did such a great job in presenting, uh, showing the pros and cons of all these three technologies very well. And then I presented on, on why CFD is important, whether you're doing dilution or reactive air and Chadley, did an excellent job presenting the ionization technology and showing how ions can help agglomerate the uh, small particles and thereby improving the efficiency of filter. So it was very well received, very well attended, and hope this committee that is formed in Ashley will continue this dialogue. And we're gonna talk a little more about the committee um, later in the show. And, and I, I have a feeling we may need not only extra time today, but another show to, to actually do this justice. But, uh, Dr. Arabs, let's let's talk a little bit about, you've talked about how the technology works. Let's take a look at some photos of the actual units so that people can maybe visualize a little better how they're installed in buildings. And then we can talk about some of your research and some of your experience with those who are using this technology in their buildings. Let's start with maybe you could explain to folks what we're looking at now. Well, this is the, the Pure Mini, and it's a designed for personal size spaces. And it scales uh, in several models of this size to about 500 square feet. So you can put it in a bedroom. And because we quantitatively know what concentration of uh, oxidants it produces, uh, even with 
got the best ventilation, we stay within very safe parameters. So this is small, convenient, and portable. And are there optics inside of this that we're not seeing? Every device that generates a hydroxyl has an optic, which is a UV quartz device, similar to a high-performance light bulb, if you will, that generates UV radiation of a very specific distribution of wavelengths that optimizes the formation rate of hydroxyls. So yeah, they all have these light bulbs in them. And then, so there's a light bulb um, that is, and where are the hydroxyls? Are they generated internally here or are they taken out of the air? How How does that work? They're formed immediately upon irradiating water vapor and air. So our our source is the ever-present relative humidity in in any space. And as soon as they're formed in 20 to 50 milliseconds, they interact with the abundance of VOC that's always around them, and they form these organic peroxy radicals. Those are the reactive species that get to travel around the treatment space. And in a portable device, they're circulated by device fans that are inside the unit in order to get good circulation and airflow in these smaller spaces. John, let's go to the next one so we can get an idea of how maybe they're installed in in a mechanical system such as what we're showing here. Now we're looking at a commercial application and, and this is a scaled up version of that and it contains multiple optics Uh, higher performance optics. And as you can see, it's integrated directly into the airflow stream of the HVAC system. It does not have its own fan. As Kishore rightly pointed out, it depends on its efficacy by the distribution of airflow by the HVAC system. So where the units are placed relative to the design of a particular application uh, is of importance. And that's specified by Pure's technology staff an engineering team. So in this case, uh, this is a commercial space, an industrial application, and this probably had about 14 optics in it. And, you know, the big thing now is COVID and other, you know, flu, other airborne pathogens, essentially. How does the, um, how do these radicals, these hydroxy radicals affect viruses, bacteria, fungi, and how do we show that? Well, both the hydroxyls inside the device start working immediately. They interact with and decompose microorganisms by uh, taking hydrogen atoms away from the proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids that protect the microorganism. They, They cleave the cell wall and the microorganism dies. The organic peroxy radicals do the same thing. So outside in the treatment space, they circulate and wherever they find a microorganism, they react with it and decompose it. We evaluate this in standardized laboratory conditions in third-party labs. And we've moved on in terms of our uh, methodology with these facilities to test in large room size chambers with devices, commercial devices scaled for that size of chamber generating the concentrations you would see in your own space and measuring the kill rates of aerosolized microorganisms and surface bound microorganisms distant from the source in the test chamber. So we do our best in a test chamber to simulate real world environmental situations. And we apply that knowledge to scaling up to larger spaces. How I've always been confused by this and maybe you can help me with it. Um, If this technology is causing issues within a virus or bacteria or whatever, so that it is no longer a problem, a health problem for people, why isn't it doing similar things to our own microbiome? Humans, plants, and animals have evolved symbiotically with hydroxyls for millennia. We've developed mucosa and an epidermis. Uh, that protects our nasal passages, eyes, lung tissues, et cetera. So we basically are safe, bathed in hydroxyls. It's like sitting on your back porch. Pure designs their devices to generate those same concentrations. No more, no less. So we know that it's both effective and safe. Uh, The atmospheric hydroxyls do not penetrate the body in any way. And 
you're you're generating similar to what's outdoors, and that's because what's outdoors doesn't get indoors. That's a good point. I mean, a hydroxyl has a lifetime of two to 50 milliseconds. So you open your window and a few of them come in and within a fraction of an inch, they're all consumed by the VOC. There's no sunlight in your house. There's no UV source to continue the, uh, the generation process. And so basically, Pure is just replacing the UV source that's the sun outdoors indoors. And it does so quantitatively because that's the nature of the chemistry. You can actually design different devices to recreate that same concentration, whether it's 500 square feet or 2 million square feet, just by using more and more powerful optics. And a good, and VH, a good go HVAC ahead. system. So. John, I think we have one other photo. I just wanted to make sure that we covered everything because I know you sent three and I didn't know if there was something different about this one that we should point out. Well, it's an intermediate unit and it's really been very useful and applicable in, in vertical markets like cruise ships and casinos and hospitals where they have vintage HVAC systems convoluted and they need to have many smaller units rather than one big one mounted somewhere. And so this is an induct unit. It features interactive process controls that are fed by sensors throughout the treatment space to modulate performance of the optics. That's one way we ensure that we're turning up more or turning down the optic output uh, to maintain the right concentration. So these sensors feed back data and that big one you saw has an abundance of uh, interactive sensor-driven process controllers as well. That's standard on that custom series and for this induct series as well. And where, where would PHO not be applied? Where would you not recommend people use this? Well, we've had applications, industrial applications from uh, industrial processing that has an active stream of VOC and what we've discovered is that the airflow in the conduit is too fast. We just can't keep up with it. It's down the chute and up the stack too fast. And uh, this is not particularly effective at that. They need to be scrubbing things like that. We also have an upper limit, practically speaking, of concentrations we can deal with. So if you're generating pollutants, let's say a, a commercial application, you're doing milling operations and you're, you're getting uh, byproducts from the organic lubricants. If you get above about 500 parts per million or so, we're gonna really have to crank up the production of that. So that becomes uh, an issue with how many units and where we place them in your facility. Connie, uh, at the beginning, I. I you know, when you were going through the heavy chemistry, um, I'm sure that most of our listeners, if not all of our listeners, really didn't have a clue of, of what you were of what you were saying. What I'd like you to do, if you can do it, if you don't mind, is imagine you were talking to a kindergarten class. How would you explain what this machine does to a kindergartner? This device is designed to generate chemicals in safe concentrations to get rid of pollutants in your room, in your house, in your school, in the same way that the sun cleans the outdoor air so that the outside environment is safe for humans, plants, and animals. So we're trying to recreate a natural process that wouldn't ordinarily be occurring inside. Okay. Interesting. Cliff, you have early, yeah, <laughs> or, no, no, I, I, no, I, I think it helps, particularly when you're taking notes, and uh, that's a whole lot easier than uh, a page and a half of uh, a page and a half of <laughs> yeah. notes. So, Cliff, can I jump in here? Yeah, please do. Said, yeah, uh, please. I yeah. myself uh, also put a lot of efforts in understanding. So, what I did is during my presentation, I put it simple slide on and that may help explain again i don't claim to be expert in this one uh, and and this is what i learned and i'm i'm just uh, trying to share with you very quickly if you allow me so what i learned is 
when the UV and the water vapor come together, they create this hydroxyl OH radical. So this one part, that's what the machine is doing. Now the second part is when these hydroxyl radicals react with the VOCs or microorganisms, they also produce another radical. They call it oxy-free radical, which is ROO. And what was news to me that these ROO radicals actually are also sanitizing agents, okay? So uh, they also, so basically you can see the chain reaction uh, that these radicals then again react with the VOCs and produce another sanitizing agent. So this kind of, if you can see this medicine, while it is working, it is producing more uh, medicine. But where is the end to this? Is it a perpetual cycle? No, it's not. So what I learned from uh, Dr. Raps and uh, Dr. Crosley is that when these two radicals bump on each other, uh, then they lose their power. So, so basically, uh, this is not, not a perpetual system. So I uh, hope <laughs> I try to explain the chemistry, which I'm not, uh, 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 I'm not an expert in it. <laughs> I think I think that's helpful. Very good. Yeah, yeah, that's oh. very helpful. <laughs> Let's let's um what I'd like to do is I want to break for halftime. When we come back for the second half, I want to get into a little bit more about how you use the CFD um to really essentially apply it to determining what the efficacy of this type of uh reactive air cleaning is. So we'll be back in 60 seconds with Dr. Arabs and Dr. Pankari. Our key sponsor is first on site your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration <laughs> company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org. AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC. CRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee. AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, HealthyIndoors.com. I just want to give a shout out to Tramex Meters. Thanks for joining our family of sponsors. And um, RIA is up next. Sorry, I didn't get you on there this week. We ran out of time. But the Restoration Industry Association is also back as a sponsor. All right, let's go back to our, our discussion here. I think what's nice at this point, um, Kishore, if we could have you talk a little bit about how you used CFD to help with I guess people understanding and, and verifying the effectiveness of this type of technology. And one thing I, I kind of want to clarify first with Dr. Arabs and make sure that our, our listeners are aware, we're not removing particulate with this. You're changing VOCs and some particulate bacteria, viruses, et cetera, so that they're less harmful. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, PHO devices are are not made for filtration. There, there's a there's a modest filter there to protect the optics, but uh, ionization is focused on filtration. We are focused the PHO technology on chemically reacting with and decomposing the VOCs in the microorganisms and mitigating odor and preventing and minimizing the dynamic spread of pathogens indoors. 
Uh, so they're, it's different. Okay. And let's go back to you, Dr. Konkari. How, how do you use CFD to help with kind of almost visualizing what's going on here? Yeah. Uh, see, no matter what technology is, I, as I said, these boxes are producing this reactive agent. But who is taking these reagents to these sources of contact? Suppose there is an infected individual in the room, it's the air. Air is the carrier of these agents where they are needed. Correct? So this, these are the uh, vehicles uh, carrying the military uh, to the enemy, if you will. Now, the key here is how well we are distributing. And that depends on the local HVAC system. It depends on the layout, where your diffusers are, what type of diffusers you are, what is the supply air flow rate, discharge velocity, where the returns are, where people are seated, what kind of furniture they are using. We never think about furniture, but it matters because there are obstructions to airflow. And, and so the key here is the effective distribution of air uh, and these agents into the place. However, unlike our dilution theories, in this case, there are two important parameters we need to determine for each cleaning or sanitizing agent. The first one is how long they survive in the air. Okay, that's the one. Because by the time they reach the breathing zone, they may not be alive. And, and we are just sending the dead bodies to the, uh, to the enemy, correct? That's one. The second one is the their kill rate. Now, once they encounter this battle with the pathogen, how well they inactivate these pathogens or remove the chemicals, correct? Or transform them, as Dr. Raps was saying. So we, that's where CFD comes into picture. And, and let me let me share what I did uh, with this PHO uh, technology uh, uh, to prove its efficacy. So again, you may be familiar with my work that there is one infected person here. There are six people in this two cubicles, one supply, four-way diffuser, one return in this room. Pretty simple configuration. And then- Are you sharing right now, Kishore? No. Yes, I, can, can you not see it? No, no. we're not seeing oh, it. Oh, I'm so sorry, share, okay. <laughs> I'm just thinking I'm sharing. Okay, let me go back. So here is this small office space. There's six people sitting in this two cubicle. And the guy with the red head is the person who is infected, constantly uh, releasing the pathogens into the air. And then we have this four-way supply diffuser in one cubicle and one return here. Again, uh, this is kind of a hypothetical situation. Now. If you look at the airflow patterns, irrespective of whether you have a reactive agent or no agent, you can see as this air comes out from this diffuse, it bumps on this wall and creates this recirculation. Now, it means this is a stagnant zone. Air is just sitting there and circulating. In this case, there are two opposite kind of circulation patterns. The airflow patterns are much more complex in three dimensions. We need to kind of slice them out to understand what is happening here. So now what happens is how long air stays into the space has major impact on all these reactive technologies. Why? Because the age of air can give us some indication whether these reactive agents are really active or not, or they are dead before they reach the breathing zone of occupant. So what you are seeing is a slice at the breathing zone of occupant. So as I showed it to you, when the air was kind of circulating there and spinning the wheels, you will see the, uh, the, the age of air, how long that air is staying in that space is pretty high. As a result, you can see the concentration of radicals where the air is just spinning is pretty low. So um, in this case, we have a higher concentration in this cubicle than this cubicle. So the chamber test, uh, Pure did, they gave me that data. And the chamber test tells me what is the age, what is the life of these radicals, correct? And then that data, aerosolized data, 
also tells me what's the kill rate, how effective they are in killing the pathogen. So when I plotted this probability of infection and I tried to compare it with dilution versus PHO, you see a big difference here. Just with dilution, you can see again the high probability of infection due to this person is very close to that person. That's common sense. Correct? If you sit with that person that close, your probability of getting sick is much higher than staying away. However, I want to point out our myth about the six foot distance. Six foot distance only works if somebody is sneezing or coughing. Hmm. I wish they would have told us, hey, this is airborne. It means it can go beyond six feet. So what you see here is even people in the other cubicle have relatively high probability of infection. It's there about 10 feet away from that guy and still their probability of infection is very high. So this is the myth. And I, I hope we would have saved several thousand millions of lives if we were known this in the first month of pandemic, correct? This is airborne. Anyway, that's a separate issue. Now what happens is once you introduce these agents, you can see in addition to dilution, they are actively removing the pathogen, inactivating them. So where the color is kind of yellow becomes green, where it is green, it becomes blue. Well, what happens here? Well, we can't control that kind of infection probability because we have an active source of pathogen there. Unless you remove that guy from that room, you're not going to clean up that room, right? So, so that is too much to expect from any technology to totally take the pathogens out from the place. Correct? Now, what I also do, I plot this in CFD, a cloud of infection. I call it spread index. It gives me kind of a metric how far the infection is spreading, correct? the probability of infection. So if you think, tell me where 10% or higher probability of infection in this space. So when I just do the dilution, it tells me almost half of the space, including those three poor guys sitting in other cubicles, are immersed in this dirty cloud, if you will. Now, when you introduce these reactive agents over the dilution, that reduces to 13% only, which is understandable that that's close to that guy where that infection, uh, that, that pathogens are really. So it shows like 73% reduction. And then we, we tried one more thing. We said, well, instead of three-year changes, what if I do two-year changes, reduce the airflow? What happened? Well, the results are pretty equivalent as to dilution. So in, in other words, if you are using this kind of reactive technologies, you can reduce your supply airflow, reduce your age changes by almost 33% here. And again, the similar cloud, uh, it shows that even with two-year changes, we can relieve these three guys uh, from that dirty zone. So uh, basically, CFD can help us prove or optimize where you should inject these reactive agents, at what rate we should inject this reactive agent, and considering that chamber data is accurate. Right? That's the key here. I mean, CFD is a tool, right? and you need to feed the information. That chamber data, in my opinion, should be developed by third party, where people can trust. I mean, not I'm not saying purists. We're kind of manipulating the data. Uh, every vendor has their own way of presenting and performing the test. There's no universal standard for that, and there is a need for that. But the key is, once we have that data, that's not enough. What is required is how it will work in real practice. And, and CFD can help us do that and optimize it. I hope I said enough. <laughs> No, I think that helps a lot. What I'd, I'd like to do is go into a couple of um, actual building scenarios. And before I do, Dr. Arabs, are there times when the mechanical system is just 
set up in a way where it's just, where you just tell people, look, I don't know that we can help you. I don't think we've ever had a situation where it was the mechanical limitations. Uh, we can pretty much integrate with any active air circulation system. We've been in cruise ships and yachts, uh, schools, you know, the HVAC systems are antique. Um, where the limitations have been in industrial applications, if the concentrations are way, way too high, and generally at that play, at that level, they're toxic. So most of the applications have, have had solutions one way or another, portable, integrated, large, small. It, just, it seems to me that you're in there working with these folks, and it would be a great time to let them know about some of the deficiencies in their system that if it was working better, maybe distributing the air better, et cetera, that, that your, your product would work better as well. Is that something, is that like a part of the service? Well, now that Kishore has so effectively demonstrated the power of CFD modeling, we have a basis to go in and say, look, it's very important that you remember that we're only as effective if we're being integrated with your systems at how well you've designed your HVAC. And so with this background now of his work, we can go in and we can provide a consulting service that does an indoor air quality evaluation. We can measure VOC levels. We can actually measure microorganism levels by bringing in third-party labs. And based on that and the modeling data, we can make some suggestions. So this is an, an evolving application space for us. And I think this also points out a need that I know you and I and, and Dr. Kankari talked about before the show for a standardized testing procedure for determining, you know, how well these products are working. Is that something that uh, either of you would like to comment on? Yeah, Joe, uh, let me let me go first on this one. Uh, I'm very keen about this issue. Uh, there is so much he says, she says going on in this space of reactive cleaning. We need a trusted third party uh, resource where they can do this in a vendor neutral format, this test. What are these two tests? The life of the radicals or cleaning agent and the kill rate. Just to bring UVC field here, correct? And then UVC space, you see that is much older than these reactive technologies. And what happened? Universities and scientists and, and independent agencies all over the world kind of put a lot of resources in determining the kill rate of UVC for different pathogens, correct? It is a kind of encyclopedia. Of, of that data available. There is a lack of such data and understanding uh, of these technologies. And there is need, and with the help of uh, experts like Dr. Ratch and Dr. Cosley, who is here in, in this meeting, they will help us to develop this standardized test. Uh, Dr. Raps, what, what are your thoughts on having a, a third-party testing protocol that, that um, I assume you want one. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we All our tests have been done with uh, licensed third-party laboratories and established uh, testing centers like the Lovelace Respiratory Research Institute. They serve the military and the government. So we, <laughs> we're willing to put ourselves out there and get the test data and most importantly, report it. So all of this is available on the website. And what I've learned over time is that, especially in microorganism testing, which is so reflective of the effectiveness of reactive air cleaners, you absolutely must rely on these third-party laboratories to set a standard of using real-sized test chambers with devices scaled for that test chamber, working under normal use conditions to reflect as realistic a result as possible. Too often you see a big device in a small test chamber. You see devices that are generating 10 times the reactive agents in the test chamber that you would see in your own environment. And there's a lot of sleight of hand. You know, I 
I think maybe it evolved because people didn't really understand the importance of recreating a natural test environment. So the further we go down this path uh, with ASHRAE, because I'd been invited to participate in helping to evolve some of these standards uh, as a chemist in a predominantly engineering environment, um, now that we're looking at reactive agents, we need a lot more chemists and physical chemists involved in being able to work together collaboratively with the engineers uh, in organizations like ASHRAE, which has tremendous influence in the industry. Let's go to the roundup, John. Today, we're going to welcome Tramex Meters on as the newest IAQ radio sponsor. Thanks so much, and uh, we look forward to a long relationship. All right, what's the limit right now on a uh, test chamber? What's the biggest one you're aware of that would be used for this type of testing? Uh, we and the uh, GPS have found uh, a laboratory that has a 20 by eight by eight foot, a 1,280 cubic foot chamber uh, that is about the largest that we have all been able to find. And, and uh, fortunately for the presentations we gave at ASHRAE, we had data from the ionizer device and, so, and the PHO device in that chamber, microorganism kill rate data. So it, it was good that it, we had the same chamber, the, cha the same COVID virus uh, done by the same company. So I'd like to see a lot more of that, uh, large chambers so far. I haven't seen any much bigger. Uh, it's very costly. A lot of these are, especially with BSL level three facilities for uh, agents as toxic as COVID, uh, these are typically stainless steel or other impervious surfaces. So that's very costly to make bigger rooms. Uh, but then again, if that's the biggest we have, just use a commercial device sized for that 1,280 cubic feet. And maybe you could tell listeners, and we'll get into this in more detail in, in our next show, but can, what are you currently doing as far as testing in real world buildings? Uh, you mean, where have we tested with our client base? Yes. Most of our large clients, uh, and I hesitate to name names, but these are these are companies that uh, whose technology you use every day and you're very familiar with. And one in particular decided to deploy our technology in every data center worldwide, because in these data centers are individuals whose health is absolutely critical. And so they did their own independent testing, brought in third-party microbiological companies and third-party chemical companies. And there are methods, standard methods for capturing microorganisms and doing testing and capturing VOC, et cetera. And one that I can name because they, they've uh, graciously published this case study is Churchill Downs. And so we were invited by them to participate uh, at the uh, Kentucky Derby, and they have all these facilities that are air conditioned and controlled and casinos. And so they really wanted to validate this. So they brought in microorganism testing companies that tested and validated our chamber data themselves and were delighted enough with the result that they have published a case study, which is available on the PURE website. So we do rely on the cooperation of our, especially our biggest clients, who are willing and interested in being able to prove that what you see in your test chamber is what I'm going to get in my facility. And Cliff, we can put a link to that in the blog so that people can read up on that before the next show. And if they have questions, they can go ahead and, and send those questions in. Cliff, I'm not able to see the uh, chat. So if you could maybe pick a question or two out here for the roundup. Yeah. For, yeah. First of all, I've got a comment, Bonnie, and, and um, there's a, um, I guess a big misunderstanding when it comes to microbial testing, and uh, you know, there, you know, generally this is done by you know to EPA specifications. And what happens is when you're testing in air and you're testing on surfaces, I think it's it, it's really entirely different. And what happens is is that it, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that your device has if I'm not mistaken, a four log, log reduction, I think on COVID or whatever you test on, would that be correct? 
Yeah, so, uh, and you know, it's, it's in the presentation, Ashley. So in, in that size chamber, in 20 minutes, it was a 99.4% reduction. In 60 minutes, it was, you couldn't find it anymore. It was 99.99%. Um, I, 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 I understood, understood. And the, sur the surface samples, because at, at the same time for the same test, we had surface samples uh, with a titrated amount of biofilm on the surface samples, remote from the device source. And you saw a 99.9% kill rate on a surface, which is a lot harder to do in 60 minutes. So 20 no, to 40 I, minutes I, in there. I, I, I understand. Okay, but you're talking of four log reduction. Uh, EPA, you know, deals with six log reduction. If you're saying that you've sterilized the surface, it's a six log reduction. And you know, as you know, there's a big difference between four log and and and, and six log. But in, in any of that, my biggest concern is really this term, the the use of the word safe. It's safe to use this in an occupied area. You know, the EPA doesn't let any disinfectant say that this is safe. They just don't allow it. And yeah, the, the the challenge that I have is that I'm just real concerned about just saying this is safe in any occupied area. You have no idea what the background chemical chemistry is. You know, you know how it works on VOCs, but you don't necessarily know, you know, what's in there. And and some strange things can happen, such as you know, after fire damage situations, these machines have been utilized, and you know, people walk in the room and the room has a haze, which you know, I think the assumption is uh, this is a, a production of fine particles and. Uh, and you know what? Go you ahead. You bring up a, a very good point. So first of all, none of these devices will sanitize. We're not, none of them will ever get down to a six log reduction. Nor do we have the technology to even measure six log, practically speaking, and prove it. So the FDA, when we had a portable device that was registered, set a target for efficacy at three, two to three log reduction. So we got a four to five log reduction, and they were they were very impressed. Uh, and it's now become a standard, and the ionizers can achieve similar levels, although they they use ion concentrations at twenty to forty million ions per cubic centimeter, where natural levels top out at about fifteen hundred. But nonetheless, these are both natural sanitizing agents. the The issue about safety, so, no one can measure in real time the dynamic chemistry that's going on. Uh, leaving out a fire situation where you shouldn't be walking around until the entire space is not only sanitized, but ventilated and qualified to be reoccupied. But in normal environments, uh, the FDA basically said to us when we said, how do we know that this is safe? And they said their standard vice safety evaluations is an FDA toxicology study according that they published. And so we did that. We did a toxicology study using their method, 13 weeks, three to four times concentrations of these reactive agents on a statistically significant population of animals bred to represent human health. And they, they looked at the growths and cellular changes in these animals after the 13 weeks, behaviorally and after necropsy. And they're in this test, with the device that was used. It was a boss, it was a fairly big device, three times, four times sized for that space. They saw no measurable changes in the animals behaviorally, physically, or chemically at the gross or cellular level. Their comments to me were that you have satisfactorily passed our safety test. And right now, that's the only standard that I know of that is applicable to what these reactive air cleaners are doing. You know, typically, you know, I, I think FDA does it a little bit differently. You know, they do. And again, I'm not sure what type of study this was because it would be hard to do uh, some of the technologies. You know, FDA does oral, they do dermal, and they do inhalation. So I'm not sure exactly what type of study uh, this would be. Probably, I guess, inhalation. I, I guess in dermal, right? You, would, this, you, can, you can't feed is, it to them, right? This is their CFR 28. I, I have the number somewhere here somewhere, but uh, it's they're published standard for evaluating the output of any device, whether it's reactive agents, uh, it's generating uh, energy of any sort, any kind of chemicals that you could possibly produce, they don't care. They say, we only want to evaluate the effect 
it has on a suitable simulant for a human being. No, no, I understand that. So and, yeah. that's that's the closest that, so it's, it's not, um, I guess I can send you, and I think in the notes that uh, I provided, there is the uh, particular reference number for that study. Yeah, it's hey. somewhere. <laughs> and we'll put it out in the blog too. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, now yeah, no, we'll list it. But oh, here uh, it is. It's twenty-one CFR Part fifty-eight, and it's a good laboratory GLP FDA methodology that they've published to evaluate device performance. Device under, uh, no, understood. But you know, going back just to the EPA for a minute. Typically, when they do these tests, you know, on animals. They do, they kill 50% of them. So they determine what the lethal dose is of that substance in order to kill those rats, you know, the LD50. So that's generally how a lot of the toxicology data, you know, is compared, you know, with permissible exposure limits and, and so on and so forth. And I think that's, you know, I think that's a question that actually came up in the chat was what is the, you know, permissible exposure limit and, you know, for, hydroxyls and, and can it be adjusted? You know, can we turn the machine up? Can we turn the machine down? What happens, you know, at lower span, fan speed, higher fan speed? You know, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of questions. It's, and, it, it's uh, a very good question. And uh, we start out by recreating natural concentration. So if, if we can quantitatively, and we do this by knowing the output of the optics, the relative humidity and the temperature, we size a device for a particular space to hit that sweet spot. If we have a device with interactive sensor-driven process controls, the remote sensors are measuring oxidant levels, which include ozone and include all the other oxidants that could be generated by the device. If those oxidant levels that the client has, they don't wanna have a 50 part per billion level, they want it to be 30, we can dial down and set the standard for these interactive process controllers to meet a 30 part per billion standard. Typically, we use ozone sensors because they are available and they're calibrated uh, for the environment. There's cross sensitivities with the oxidants, but let's just say it's all a little bit of ozone. If you target ambient levels plus another couple parts per billion, and you want your environment to be at 20 parts per billion, that still is an efficacious level. The device will still be effective at that. It's better at higher levels, but if you want to be really cautious, we can accomplish that. Um, I guess most of my, my questions really regard, you know, fire restoration uses for it, because that's where I'm mostly, you know, familiar with it. So I guess is it is it your rec, you know, is it your recommendation that these devices be used, you know, following fire damages, you know, you know, after ventilation, but certainly before cleaning. Mm -hmm. We have the first big vertical, major vertical for the company, and we've been in restoration for 15 years. Right. Uh, was the uh, detoxification and the sanitization and the deodorization after fires. And I, I can just say as an example that uh, Costco had a major fire in Miami. It, it just devastated the whole facility. It was smoked out. They were getting ready to throw out all their soft goods. And they brought in Pure, HGI at the time, and they treated this couple you know, million, two to three million cubic foot space for three days. Uh, unoccupied at very high oxidant levels. And when they got done, they did not have to throw out any of their soft goods. There was no odor and they repopulated the commercial property on day four. I understood. Uh, and again, you know, no argument there. there. There are other technologies, you know, that would work in a similar manner. You know, some might take more time, some might take significantly less time. Uh, you know, when it comes to odors, I, th I think you need different, different technologies for different types of odors. They're, they're certainly not all, uh, uh, you know, oxidation doesn't work on all of them equally well. They're, 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 they can be very, very different. I think it works well on some uh, and it works well on some types of fire odors actually, but not so well on the plastics and things like that. Uh, it, you know, that's kind of been- See that the thing experience. with plastics is a lot of the odor is localized 
in the matrix of the polymer itself, as, as it's heated and it outgasses and it begins to generate its own VOC, there are residual odiferous compounds that are stuck on the surface of the plastic. And most of the reactive air cleaners are designed to clean air and to a limited degree, deodorize surfaces. But if it goes down several molecular levels beyond where the vapor phase can get to, it's gonna continue to smell. You're right. All, All right. right, I'm done. Cliff. I think yeah, we'll catch up uh, next time. I guess you know because yeah, I think, I think we've got show. quite a few yeah, we uh, a lot of shows follow up some questions, questions, and I know we'll get more after the show. So we're right. going to go ahead and schedule a second show with Dr. Raps and and Keyshore. But before we go, um, Keyshore, I wanted to ask you: Is there anything you wanted to add that might kind of tie things together for us before we get into the uh, next show? Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, bringing me in. Um, one thing, as you can see now, there is a huge chasm between engineers and chemists here. Now, both these parties need to understand each other very well. What they are saying, uh, as Cliff was saying, put it at the kindergarten level so that chemistry we can appreciate and understand. And same thing in our HVAC field, what we talk about, our terminologies are kind of Greek to chemists uh, who are working in this. So bringing these two parties together, Ashley is doing a good job on that by forming that committee. Number two, look at our commissioning process. Now, how are you going to do the commissioning for such devices? Number one, there are no instrumentation uh, or, or equipment available to readily measure the uh, hydroxyl concentration or RO concentration, ion concentration, and then further its effect on, on the microorganism. So basically you will have to put the petri dishes and that will even just do the job for surface cleaning, correct? What happens to aerosol? This is very uh, difficult to kind of commission and measure in real world. We have to rely on the chamber test, control test to get their efficacy and then use technique like CFD to optimize the performance. So those are my, my, my thoughts. I thank you for that. And before we go, before we wrap things up, Dr. Raps, I, I guess I want to ask if you could to summarize what we've talked about here today for our listeners and add anything that you think we missed that's important to get before we head into uh, part two later? I, I didn't get a chance to really include ionizers uh, in, in the three major categories of reactive air cleaners, PHO, PCO, and ionizers. And uh, Charlie Waddell did a very good job at the seminar talking about how effective ionization is at driving the aggregation of particulates and improving filtration, uh, especially of very small particles. Ionizers do to a certain degree kill microorganisms and decompose VOC, but it's different chemistry, it's ionic chemistry. And so the kinetics are different. Uh, and so we are working as, as an industry trying to quantify better the actions of these three major types of reactive air cleaning. I think the reactive air cleaning is the future for improving indoor air quality, because as we've learned painfully, the transmission of disease indoors is extremely dynamic. It's driven by localized in the breathing zone among individuals, and HVAC and dilution methodology is insufficient. And so we're both all hoping that the marriage of reactive technologies with HVAC will take us to the next level of providing safer indoor air environment for people. And before we go, what's we've talked about the committee, but we never really discussed what kind of committee it is at ASHRAE. Are you? Is it a committee to investigate the issue more? Is it a committee to develop a standard? Is it a committee to develop a testing standard? What are we? What are we talking about here, Kishore? Yeah. So this is a task group committee. It means now they are uh, all got together, different disciplines. Uh, and then eventually that will lead to the standard for, for such reactive clinic technology. 
And will there be a, a call for members or have the members already been formed? I mean, I, I know some people that might be very interested that, that are at the forefront of this research in the, in the research world. Yeah, so the voting members are already decided for this committee. But if anyone wants to apply, there is a procedure for that to become or you will be invited to be part of that. Number two, you can be always guest to this uh, committee meeting. You can ask them to be included in the invitation. You can voice your concerns during this meeting. However, try to understand this is not yet the standards committee. It's not developing. It's just doing the spread work, if you will, before we go to the standards. You know, it's a fascinating area. It's a fast developing area. We appreciate having both Dr. Connie Raps and Kishore, Dr. Kishore CFD Konkari. Uh, <laughs> it's always great to have you on. And I uh, look forward to talking again. Uh, we about three, four weeks down the road. We'll coordinate with you, see when you're available. But uh, really look forward to it and appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you very thanks. much for having me. My pleasure. All right, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Dr. Connie Raps and Dr. Kishore Kankari, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of our loyal audience and sponsors. We couldn't do it without you, sponsors. Thank you so much. Next week, uh, we're going to have Robert Higgins back on. We, we've done a bunch of these concrete moisture shows, and I just felt like it was time to kind of tie it all into a neat package here and put a bow on it. So we're going to have Bob join us next week on the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>